Damn it. Damn it. Damn Screw this game. Hey, Kyle. You ready to record? Anything but Dark Souls. The opposite of Dark Souls, please. Okay, okay. Let's see what we have. What about some Animal Crossing? Too cute. Mario Kart. Too fast. Okay, how about some clacks? Well, what even is it? Put that back. What about a good old C64 game, huh? Yeah, alright. Nice. Let's do this. Betray the Dark Souls for this. Oh, stop whining. Look, basically, there's a crazy scientist, Alvin, and he's hacking into U.S. nuclear codes in his underground base. There were two other guys that were sent before you, but they probably died, so it's all up to you, and you've got a couple of hours left until nuclear destruction. Good luck! Wait, I wasn't even the first choice? Well, this is your moment to prove yourself. All right, well, I guess I'll just start in this room over here. Oh, hello. You're a cute robot. What's your name? Oh. Well then, screw you too. Yeah, the robots are bad. Can I kill them? Nope, and you lose 10 minutes every day. Cool, cool. You know what? I don't think this is for me. I'm just gonna go back and get my ass kicked into Dark Souls. Come on, Kyle. The Commerce is a great system. Don't you know its history? I mean, yeah, a bit. The Commodore 64 was pretty much the best-selling computer in history. It was developed in 1981 by Jacek Trmiel. Let me tell you about this guy. Not only did he put his company above all the other competition for years, but he pushed right through the video game crash of the 80s like it was nothing. Supposedly, Trmiel also got his hands on a bunch of elusive relics. A golden crown, jewel-encrusted gold sword, white jade philosopher stone. What? Oh yeah, those were the prices for an old Atari competition with the Sword Quest games. Trammell bought the consumer division of Atari shortly after the crash, and so he must have just taken them for himself. Although that's never been confirmed. Unfortunately, he died in 2012, and so that mystery may never be solved. Anyways, the system debuted in 1982, retailing at 600 bucks. Shit, that's expensive. Not really, considering the Apple II and IBM PC were over a thousand bucks each. The C64 was actually more powerful too. They made a lot of smart design choices with the C64 using older operating software and plastic casing of their old computer models. Even still, the hardware is very impressive. It was the best sounding computer in the world. It was also really helpful that it was so easy to use. Learning to program on it was simple, and even if you were technologically challenged, you could still run your programs with little trouble. Yeah, I learned to program on that thing when I was six. But definitely what made the C64 was its huge gaming appeal. Literally thousands and thousands of games were developed for the system. And that's not an over-exaggeration. Look, I get it. Commodore's a great system. That's fine. I'm not arguing that. That doesn't make me want to play Impossible Mission any more than before. Are you sure? You know this game is a pretty important milestone for the system. Did you know that was made by just one guy? Look, no, I'm... Wait, wait really? Impossible Mission is about infiltrating the secret underground base of mad scientists. It was created by Dennis Caswell and published by Epix in 1984. And when I say created, I mean created. He designed and coded the entire thing on his own. Jesus. Yeah, not even in a programming language either. He wrote this for the C64's hardware directly, designing levels by drawing them on graph paper. Wait, Jesus did? But no, Caswell. About the only thing he didn't do personally were the electronic sounding voices. For those, he got some people called Electronic Speech Systems to prepare for him. Wow, aptly named. I wonder if those guys are still around. I mean, there can't be much of a market for these kinds of things, you know? Oh, what do you know? They're making sound chips. Fitting. Epics also came out with the Summer and Winter Games and the Fabulous Chips Challenge. We're not talking about that. Come on, haven't you ever played it? I loved this game as a kid. Anyways, Castle joined the company back when it was called Acadia before it reformed into Epics. Funnily enough, these guys also worked on a handheld console called the Handy Game, which Atari then took over and developed into the Atari Lynx. I actually still have one of these things. It's, um, 
pretty neat, if not excessively bulky. Great, perfect for playing Gauntlet. Yeah, who thought these controls were a good idea? Why the hell would anyone want to play Sideways? Right, so Caswell also worked on Blaster Patrol, Party Mix, and Escape from the Mind Master. Ooh, that sounds cool. <laughs> it was for its time, I guess. So Impossible Mission took about 10 months to create. One of the things that made it really unique besides the voices was the character animation. You didn't usually see such well-developed models and walk cycles. Most of the time you're just like, a box, a pixel box bumbling around. Fun fact, this was the first thing he created for the game. After that, he pretty much made the game up as he went along. But why was it called Impossible Mission? Is this based on the movie? Kyle, the movie came out in 96. Anyways, the game was inspired by war games, not Mission Impossible. Okay, that still doesn't answer where the name came from. Well, to be honest, the game didn't have a name for most of its development. When it was close to being done, someone mentioned it reminded them of the 1966 show Mission Impossible. Obviously, they couldn't call it that for legal reasons, so they cheated and switched it up. Oh, so he didn't do this all on his own. Wow, it was just the name and the voices. He did everything else. Okay, okay, just pass me the controller. I swear, ask for a cookie and I get the goddamn history of Mr. Christie. Another visitor. Stay a while. Stay forever. Uh, no thanks. I've got a food to get to in the oven. Okay, so now your main task is to search all the furniture in every room. What you're trying to do is find pieces of the password that'll open up Elvin's secret door. Why are they all in furniture? Yeah, his base doubles as his house. He hid them as a failsafe in case he ever locked himself out. Of course, he had to make them ridiculously hard to find. Keep fools like you out. Oh, I'll show him. Holy hell, what is that thing? Is that a giant floating ball? I'm sorry, I didn't realize we're jumping straight into the bullshit. Okay, 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 it's fine. I can just go across and- oh, oh, geez, oh god, what did I do? Yeah, they kill you too. Yeah, thanks, Joe. You also get these codes for snoozing the robots, which can be pretty handy, obviously, and resetting the platforms, which isn't always that handy. Otherwise, you just keep dodging the best you can. Hey, buddy, you doing all right? I think Alvin might have gotten a bit lazy with his programming. I'm sorry, did that robot just shoot lightning at me? Yeah, they have electric zappers. I don't think that's a thing. Is that a thing? Have you ever seen a Tesla coil? Yeah. Okay, now think Tesla gun. Holy shit, that's terrifying. Uh, yeah. And these babies can output a whopping 20,000 volts. A little bit complicated, but basically, a Tesla coil forces all of this electricity into the top dome, where it essentially starts to electrocute the air. Actually, the physics behind it really isn't too complicated oh, to understand at all. This isn't See, a science show. what happens show. is this. You have two copper coils, one at the base of the tower with a small number of turns, and one going up the tower over many, many turns. The bottom coil is connected to an external power source, while the top is not connected to anything. The two coils are not physically connected at all. Electricity from an outside source first powers a capacitor, a kind of battery that stores a maximum amount of charge, which is then connected in series to the bottom coil. The catch is that this connection is broken up by a spark gap basically two metal ends with space in between them. As the capacitor is charged, the voltage across the spark gap increases. So voltage is basically the charge difference between two points. Say point A has a charge of two and point B has a charge of 15. Well, the voltage will be 13 volts. The end with the capacitor is gaining all of this charge while the other end stays at zero, making a big voltage increase. So think of voltage as being kind of like the driving force that pushes the current, current being the actual flow of electricity. Where's the current driven to? Well, the path of least resistance, usually being the nearest conductor. So you have all this energy building up wanting to cross the spark gap, and eventually the buildup is so strong that it can overcome the distance and jump. When this happens, all that electricity rushes through the lower coil all at once. You see, when current moves through a coil, a magnetic field is generated. When there's a second coil in the immediate radius of the first coil, an electrical current is actually induced in the second coil. This only occurs when the field strength is changing. Imagine taking a magnetic bar and moving it back and forth next to a copper coil. You're inducing current in that coil. Think of it like a dragon that charges as you move that magnet along. So the first coil generates a magnetic field, and now the second coil has current running through it. Something fascinating about 
this phenomenon is when the two coils have a different number of turns. When this happens, the induced voltage changes. So if you start with a low number of turns and induce voltage in a coil with high number of turns, you get a large voltage increase. However, this comes at a cost of a current decrease. So there's a greater pressure moving the electrical current, but there's less electricity moving past a point per second overall. All this electrical energy is streamed right into the top dome. This acts like a kind of capacitor collecting all that charge. As this process is repeated rapidly over and over again, the top capacitor builds up so much charge that it can't contain it anymore. It gets so great that the ions in the air itself are the easiest place for the electricity to escape to. The ions are charged, causing light and sound, but losing energy along the way until it dissipates into nothing. This gives you the fantastic light show you see, and explains why the electricity doesn't just go on until infinity. If there is something in range, the electricity all streams to that thing, whether it be a rod or a person. Okay, but can these things actually kill anybody? You always see people up close next to these things, and they're always fine. <laughs> the only person they avoid is Tesla. Electricity is a huge killer, it just depends on how you design it. See, it's not necessarily the voltage that kills you, but the current, or the amount of electricity that's passing through your body. High voltage is important as it's what pushes that current past the resistance barriers like the air gap or the surface of your skin. But once the electricity is flowing through, it's just going to depend on how much of it is flowing. Anything above 10 milliamps is pretty painful. At 15, your muscles get stimulated, preventing you from letting go. And once you get to 100 milliamps, your heart muscles seize up and you die. Okay, so the only issue the game has is that it wouldn't look like such a direct stream of lightning when dry firing through the air, only when there's something in range of it. Exactly. Well, I'd say that was a shocking development. Uh, uh, did you really have to? Yes, yes I did. So, moving on. You keep going, search the furniture, grab the puzzle pieces, search uh, search the furniture. Are you, are you really just going to sit there and keep electrocuting nothing? Honestly? Maybe he's broken? Yeah, or maybe Alvin is just an asshole. All the robots you come across have different behavior patterns, so you never know how they're going to react. Some patrol back and forth, some follow you wherever you are, and some have the Tesla guns, some just sit there. Um, hey, I'm going to go check this dresser behind you. You don't mind, do you? No? Okay. Just stay right there. Don't do anything. Perfect. Um, was there a reason why you said that here? This room doesn't look any different. Just wanted to say it. Okay. Hey, well, there's a big closet down here. Oh, you'll have to come back here later at the end. Don't worry about it for now. All right, I'll just go back up and... Damn. I'm surprised we haven't come across the... <gasps> Music room! Huh? This was my favorite part as a kid. My brother would let me do it. Here, go press that keyboard. Okay. I, um... I see. Oh, so it's just like Simon says. Cool. Or not? Why isn't this working? Come on, I'm following this exactly and it's just not doing it. Here, let me try. Oh yeah, sure, like you're gonna get it. You just have to, no, what? Ah. So what you actually have to do is arrange the tones in ascending order. Good luck guessing that one. I mean, oh, okay. I guess Simon says it's a little too easy for this guy. It's gotta be complicated, you know? Evil scientist level, we're not in preschool here. Anyways, it just gives you more code to reset the platforms of robots. Kinda useful, but meh. Whatever, just keep going. Honestly, the platforming in this game is really tricky. When you jump, you're locked into a set arc like in the Castlevania games. You've gotta be really careful at certain parts or you'll just jump to the ledges completely. Man, his scream is blood curdling. I feel really bad for him when you keep killing him like that. I'm sorry, I'm trying my best. W wait, how do I get up over there? The gaps in the platforms make it so I can never get to the elevator. What if I go on the edge? No, oh, the screen border. What the hell? Just try walking. Yeah, right. Like, I can just walk across. Really? I mean, pretty technically impressive and all that it matters where foot lands, but really? Oh, another ball, eh? I won't let you get away from me! Ha! Take that! Oh shit, oh shit, it's coming back! Crap, I only have 20 seconds left. You're at the last few pieces, you can do this! Perfect. <sighs> All right, let's try this again. Unlimited time, huh? Well, I don't usually like to do this, but when you're dealing with bullshit like this, you gotta fight fire with fire. 
Wow, great job. It only took you 100 deaths. Okay, so now I just put them together somehow. What am I looking at here? You collected 36 pieces of the puzzle throughout the game. Each piece matches up with three other pieces, making nine total combinations you need to match up. Once you match four, you uncover a letter of the nine letter password. The only rule is that the shapes on the cards you put together can't overlap. You're trying to fit them like a puzzle. You can flip the pieces vertically or horizontally. The colors also have to match, but you can change them on the bottom. You have to place the pieces on top of each other so no part of it overlaps. Uh, wow, this is really hard. You can call in to help and see if you're on the right track. A solution exists. Thanks. Well, don't take too long. It spells out something. Huh. Okay, I guess we did. No. 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 Mission accomplished. Congratulations.